Good evening. Welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Rukmini Banerjee, and I am one of your three Athenaeum Fellows for the year. The Cuban Missile Crisis is often considered the closest the world has come to escalating into a full-scale nuclear war. During the standoff, then-President Kennedy thought the chance of war was between one and three and even, and what we have learned in later decades has done nothing to lengthen those odds. We now know, for example, that in addition to nuclear-armed ballistic missiles, the Soviet Union had deployed 100 tactical nuclear weapons to Cuba, and the local Soviet commander there could have launched these weapons without any additional codes or commands from Moscow. The resulting war might have led to the death of 100 million Americans and over 100 million Russians. To speak about the enduring impact of this crisis, as well as introduce us to new perspectives and sources, we have with us today Professor Serhii Ploki. Serhii Ploki is the Mikhailo Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History at Harvard University. His research focuses on the intellectual, cultural, and international history of Eastern Europe, with an emphasis on Ukraine. He is the author of many books, some of which are Adams and Ashes, A Global History of Nuclear Disasters, published in 2022, as well as The Frontline Essays on Ukraine's Past and Present, published in 2021. Professor Plocky is the recipient of the Lionel Gerber Prize and the Shevenko National Prize in Literature. Since 2013, Professor Plocky has served as the director of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, where he leads a group of scholars working on MAPA, the Digital Atlas of Ukraine, an online GIS project. Today, Professor Plocky will guide us in a re-examination of the Cuban Missile Crisis. He will reference his 2021 book, Nuclear Folly, A History of the Cuban Missile Crisis. His book has been deemed superbly researched and uncomfortably timely. A reviewer, when describing the book, said, in his answer to the perennial question of who blinked first, Professor Plocky emphasizes that both sides were operating in a dark room of deception and mutual suspicion. So when one side blinked, it took the other side more than a day to realize what had happened. Today, Professor Plocky will deliver the Gold Center for Humanistic Studies 2022 to 2023 Learner Lecture on Hinge Moments in History. Before we get started, a few quick reminders. Please take this time to silence and put away your phones. We have an amazing speaker for you today, so be present, get ready to ask some good questions. As usual, video and audio recording by the audience is strictly prohibited, and per college policy, it is always recommended to wear a mask when not actively eating or drinking. Welcome to the Athenaeum. Thank you very much for this for this introduction, and in general, thank you. Thanks a lot for inviting me to give to give this talk. It's a pleasure. I had a chance to meet with students and and ask, answered the questions that they had regarding the Cuban Missile Crisis, but also regarding war uh, war in Ukraine and and global global order and whether that order still exists or not. Um, as was uh, presented here, my uh, discussion today of the Cuban Missile Crisis is very much based on uh, the book that was published uh, two years ago. And uh, when I was working on that book, of course, I was interested in the subject of the, um, per se, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the, the nuclear race. But I couldn't really imagine that the um, situation like the Cuban Missile Crisis, or at least the nuclear blackmail, would come back to the, to the international arena as soon as it, it did in the case of the all-out Russian aggression against Ukraine and the threats to use nuclear weapons by uh, Vladimir Putin. The latest what I read on the use of the nuclear weapons by Putin was apparently the concern of President Macron of France, who recently had a conversation with him, and Putin suggested that to win a nuclear war, uh, no one should worry too much about that, but because uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed that you can win the nuclear war by not attacking major cities. So Macron understood that he was not going to attack Kyiv, but probably attack other, other cities. And there was, of course, warning coming, uh, unspecified warning coming from the uh, US administration, from President Biden administration, on what could happen or would happen if 
Putin actually decided to use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, the country that was in the physical possession of the third largest arsenal in the world after United States and Russia, and gave it up as part of Budapest Memorandum in 1994. So references to the Cuban Missile Crisis are flying all over because that is and was the largest nuclear crisis in global history. And uh, what I will try to do in this presentation is also try to answer the question of whether there are any lessons from the Cuban Missile Crisis that we can learn today and that can help us to get out of this, uh, of this uh, situation of the war in general, but also the possibility of the nuclear war and nuclear exchange that is, uh, that is uh, concerns so many, so many of us today. To do that, I am uh, going to talk about the research that I had undertaken as the result of, the, uh, of my work on the, on the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and um, present my analysis against, against the dominant narrative of the history of the crisis that exists uh, not just in the United States, but also in the world in general. And that uh, dominant narrative is there, was presented by Robert Kennedy when he co-authored the book uh, that is called 13 Days that served as the basis also for a very successful uh, film and, and, and movie production and so on and so forth. Um, in, uh, that, in that book, which is um, written, um, written really very well, e easy to read, easy to understand, uh, Robert Kennedy presents himself and his brother as the uh, team that was able to withstand numerous pressures coming from um, certainly Khrushchev and the Soviet Union on the one hand, and from the, from the military, the hawks, uh, on, the, on the other hand. Well, um, what we know today that the 13 days presented just part of the, part of the story. Uh, Robert Kennedy was preparing to run for the presidency in the United States, and that was the book, as sort of uh, the book that related, starting with Jimmy Carter, people started to write there their autobiographies before running for the presidency. So it presented some parts of the story, but not others. And we know now that because the secret tapes that were there before Nixon tapes, the secret tapes that JFK was uh, um, recording those conversations, we now know really what, what happened behind the closed doors in the White House. And one thing that is uh, uh, clear, at least uh, certainly for me, is that Robert Kennedy himself was the, the biggest hawk on the executive committee, something that we, we don't know certainly from his, uh, from his memoirs. We also know that JFK was wavering that during the first week of the crisis, he was the one who was advocating the, the um, uh, strike, the air strike against the missile uh, positions on Cuba, and then changed, later changed his mind supporting the, the um, quarantine or the, the military blockade, naval blockade option. So um, the, the story is not wrong, but the story uh, presented by, by Robert Kennedy, but it is, it is, much, more, it is much more complicated. What is missing from that narrative entirely is that the Cuban Missile Crisis was actually an international crisis. That yes, the White House and, and the, 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 the meetings of the executive committee were one of the uh, really places where the drama of the Cuban Missile Crisis was unfolding. But by the nature, it was the crisis that involved certainly Moscow and, and Khrushchev and also what has been overlooked very much was that an important role in that crisis was played by Cuba and by Fidel Castro himself. So that is one of <coughs> the things that I was, <coughs> and I'm, I was trying to really um, research uh, in, in my own work on the history of the crisis, so to go beyond 
beyond uh, uh, the narrative of Kennedy on what was happening in the White House, go, to go beyond what was happening in the White House per se, and also to a degree possible to write the history of that Cuban crisis from below. Because many d key decisions and, and uh, potentially fateful decisions were not made by the principles uh, involved in the crisis. On certain, uh, in certain stages, they lost control over the developments on the ground, over their troops, and the, the uh, agency went to the relatively low rank commanders. And again, that story of the crisis from below is something that uh, has not been, has not been uh, researched well. Finally, there was one more uh, angle that I, I uh, looked at uh, in my history of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The crisis ended up without nuclear Armageddon, something that very many people were afraid, were concerned about, worked very hard to avoid that scenario. And, but our vision that it was avoided just because there were wise people and, and JFK at the end was making important and right decisions is, is incomplete picture of the crisis and really makes it very difficult, almost impossible to learn any lessons from what happened there. I'm taking a different approach. I'm saying let me look at things that went wrong, the mistakes that were made, and by looking at the mistakes, that's maybe the, 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 the shortest way to the, to the lessons, to the, 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 the most direct way to learn from the, from the, uh, from the um, experience of the crisis. Because some of the participants were saying that the war was avoided very often by sheer luck. And again, my research shows that there were really episodes where the luck was, was on the side of the not just of one country or another, the, the luck was on the side of all of us who, who, and, and people who lived before us who avoided the nuclear war. So what, what were those key misunderstandings? And that's again, that's, we, we, we start talking about the mistakes, which also I in, uh, invite you, I will come to that at the end of the lecture, but I invite you already now to think also about the situation of today and whether there is any relevance between, between mistakes and miscalculations that were made back then and, and something, and, and, and those things that we can, we can repeat, we can repeat them again. So one thing that uh, JFK never really was able to understand or to grasp, and people around him actually were not very helpful in that, he never realized why why, can, uh, why Khrushchev was doing what he was doing. Why he decided to um, risk the, the uh, nuclear war. Why he decided to bring the nuclear weapons to Cuba. And uh, um, without actually understanding of the motives of the other side or the way how the mind on the other side works, it was really very difficult to find out the, the, the way out of the crisis and to find solution. And uh, uh, the, 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 reasons, the reasons for Kennedy not understanding what was happening was very different. The, both he and Khrushchev, they come certainly from very different generations, from very different experience, very different social backgrounds, educational, very different political systems and the careers that they had. Um, uh, Kennedy never, and, and again, the, the, the advisors were never being able to, to also realize that Khrushchev was acting out of insecurity. Uh, he was a master bluffer. He, was con he convinced the world, and including Kennedy at some point, that there was a missile gap between the Soviet Union and the United States and that that missile gap was in favor of the Soviet Union. Sputnik was there to demonstrate that the Soviet Union was ahead of the United States. Gagarin was there and his flight in 1961 was actually serving the same purpose. And, and uh, Khrushchev was coming to the United Nations and saying that we are producing missiles as, as uh, sausages. 
And his son asked him, why are you saying that? You know that we are not doing that. He said, it doesn't matter that we don't do that or don't have that. Let the Americans think that that is the only way that they will not attack us. So Khrushchev was thinking that US was going to attack the Soviet Union. Um, and the reality was that uh, he didn't have the right kind of missiles, the long range missiles that could reach the territory of the United States from the Soviet Union. The US was about to start the deployment of Minutemen, the first generation of the missiles that could reach the territory of the Soviet Union from Montana and other states in the United States. The Soviet Union had nothing to match that. And his decision on the, in that uh, uh, regard was to move his medium range missiles to Cuba. So that they, and, and create in that sense a balance, a balance of fear, a balance, a balance of terror, the, the term balance of terror belongs to Churchill. And uh, that, was, that was the story that uh, actually um, was also American story in the 1950s when Eisenhower moved the American uh, medium range missiles to Turkey because there was no missiles that could reach the Soviet territory from the, from the United States. Well, um, for Khrushchev uh, couldn't, couldn't really understand also, or couldn't predict the behavior of, of Kennedy. He was uh, mm, convinced that he was dealing with young and inexperienced president whom he can push around. The Bay of Pigs uh, uh, debacle showed to him that Kennedy was very indecisive. He couldn't believe why Kennedy starting the operation against Cuba actually never, never allowed it to be, to be completed. Uh, and uh, uh, he, was, he was trying to play Kennedy. One thing that Khrushchev never understood was actually the way how the American political system worked. He looked at Kennedy as basically being another, another authoritarian leader on the other side of the, like himself, who could make whatever decisions he wanted to make. He didn't understand that there was the Congress, that there was Senate, that there were elections that were coming in November of 1962. And from that point of view, when the crisis came, Kennedy said, okay, there is no real change in the balance of power with the Soviet missiles being in Cuba, but the crisis is political. He was really concerned about impeachment. That's what he was telling his brother, and that's what was caught on the, on the tapes, on, on the secret tapes. So not understanding how the American system worked actually also made emboldened Khrushchev to, to uh, move his missiles to, to Cuba, also not realizing what that would do to the American reaction and to the American, uh, to, 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 to the American resolve to fight back. He um, was thinking in the terms that, well, you put your missiles to Turkey and I did nothing. We have our missiles that can reach Paris and the the, the, the Europeans do nothing. Why do you want to be treated differently? What is the big deal? We all live under the threat of the, of the missile attack. But again, that was completely not understanding and misreading the, 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 the American history and the American understanding and here till today. What in the world did he think? He, was, he put them next to Florida. I go there for vacations. So, so, so it, it, it's today. And some advisors of Khrushchev, like the Minister of the Foreign Affairs, Gromyka was warning, uh, warning him that, okay, the, 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 Americans, the Americans will react. They will not take this, um, uh, 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 take that the way how the Europeans are taken. So, um, uh, um, Another, another, again, going to the, to the uh, uh, one more, uh, one more um, factor that was not, was not understood by, uh, by um, Kennedy was the precarious political situation in which Khrushchev found himself. He was pretty much in charge and in control in the Soviet Union. 
Um, after Stalin's death, it took him a number of years to establish his control, but by the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, he really fully controlled Politburo. He staffed it with his clients and former aides, like uh, she just did that in, in Beijing in the, last, in, in the last few weeks, so he was, he was in, in the same place where she is today. Uh, mm, but there was, there was a challenge on the international arena and it was not coming from the United States. The challenge was coming from China. China emerged in the early 1960s as a rival of the Soviet Union for the leadership in the communist world. And there were messages coming from Fidel Castro, who declared himself to be a communist after the Bay of Pigs, specifically to get also to get aid from the Soviet Union, from Khrushchev, from one communist country to another. So the, the, the threat was that if the Soviet Union is not there to save Cuba, the uh, um, Fidel Castro could actually build much closer relations with Beijing with Mao Zedong. Um, in the um, weeks leading to Khrushchev's decision to put missiles, he made this decision in May of 1962. In April of 1962, Castro fired leading communist members of the Communist Party from the key positions in the government, sending some of them into exile into the Soviet Union and sending a clear signal to Kremlin Either you actually come and save the revolution that I declared now to be communist, or there will be the end of the Communist Party as it existed in Cuba, and I will, I will be, uh, Che Guevara was at that time already traveling to Beijing and going to, to China. So that part of the competition in the communist world, the competition between Moscow and China was also something that was, was lost on, on, the, on the American uh, um, again, uh, um, expert community and, and Kennedy was not advised on that. Uh, let me move now to another, to another um, major, uh, major mistake and miscalculation in the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, um, what you see there on the screen are the um, KGB documents, uh, part of the um, new sources that they used uh, I was the first historian to use them uh, right in this book. These are the reports of the KGB officers that uh, accompanied the ships, the Soviet ships that delivered missiles, that uh, delivered troops to, to um, uh, Cuba. 80% uh, um, of, of the personnel and, and, and missiles were shipped through the um, Black Sea uh, ports. And uh, the, those documents ended up in the KGB archive in Kiev, uh, Ukraine, and now the archive is being evacuated during the war, but I worked there in, when, when those documents were, were available. Those documents uh, explain to us the way in which the Soviet Union was able to bring the um, uh, strategic missiles to Cuba in the complete secrecy from the United States and how the Soviet Union delivered more than four times more troops to Cuba than, than uh, the US intelligence actually was aware of. So that was a major, major blunder and probably the biggest in, uh, intelligence failure in the American history. Not only that the nuclear armed missiles were delivered without actually much knowledge, they were they were discovered on Cuba uh, on uh, 13th or 14th of October, one week before they went actually fully uh, ready, battle ready. By the time the, um, uh, the, the, the blockade, the, the, the quarantine was announced, uh, many of those uh, missiles were already uh, armed, N not armed, but battle ready. The, 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 the warheads were not delivered to the, to the launching pads, but they were, they were already on Cuba as well. So c how, how could that happen? The um, key participants in the crisis, like Robert Mc McNamara, but generally the, the, the U.S. intelligence didn't learn that there were not 10,000, but 42,000 of the Soviet troops until the end of the Cold War. 
Until the end of the Cold War, no one in the US knew that on Cuba were not only strategic nuclear missiles, but also tactical nuclear missiles. They were never discovered. Never discovered until the Soviets actually admitted that they were there in, uh, in uh, uh, January of 1992, after the end, after the end of the Cold War. Uh, well, uh, this, the, the, the KGB documents tell us the story about this super secret operation, how it was planned, how it was executed, how the uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet um, uh, officer who had an um, um, uh, appendicitis attack, how they were trying to operate him and then refused to leave it uh, uh, in any hospital in the Mediterranean because they were concerned that the secret about the, the um, nuclear weapons would be, would be disclosed. This is d despite the fact that neither him nor the captain of the of this ship knew at that time where they were going. There were special envelopes that they opened only in the Atlantic, telling them where to go. Uh, they tell us the story about how the, the um, days in and days out, the Soviet uh, officers and soldiers uh, were sitting in the overheated twin decks of the ships not showing on the uh, on the on the uh, upper deck, uh, in excruciating um, high temperatures, um, and then these documents tell us the story of the Soviet withdrawal from from Cuba, which um, turned out to be extremely humiliating for the for the Red, uh, for the Soviet army. The story that was generally overlooked uh, by by the. Um, uh, by the um, American intelligence services at the time, but also at the res uh, researchers after that. Uh, the um, the uh, American uh, planes and ships were actually, uh, they got the right to inspect the Soviet ships, the so-called strip sh uh, search of the ships on their way back to make sure that the missiles were being delivered back to the Soviet Union. Castro refused to allow international inspection on the territory of Cuba. And uh, when uh, Khrushchev was removed from power in uh, two years after the crisis, in October of 1964, the uh, Minister of Defense, uh, Marshal Malinovsky, who was a strong, a strong supporter of him during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, addressed the top leadership of the army explaining his decision to support the, what was uh, effectively the palace coup against, against Khrushchev, saying that never in history either the Russian Imperial Army or the Soviet Army suffered the kind of humiliation that we suffered at Cuba. So the, the, this KGB documents demonstrate how when the orders were given to show to the American uh, m m planes the, the missiles to, to open the, the twin decks, how there were conflicts between the captains of the ships and the commanders of the, of the Soviet military uh, uh, um, units on, on those ships and how they were eventually resolved by, uh, by KGB. Um, this, is, this is an American airplane uh, over, over the Soviet of the Soviet ship on the way, on the way to Cuba. Uh, as you can see, there is there is no mm, um, missiles on the on the on, on the deck, so there is there is nothing indicating that the, the ship is actually bringing bringing weapons. This is a um, photo uh, taken by a KGB officer, again, from that archive in Kiev. Um, also um, uh, taken photo of the, of the, American, of the American airplane. So the, the US was there trying to figure out what was going on. There was surveillance, but there was no way for them to figure out what was happening under the decks, and they were filled with the with the subconscious because of the heat Soviet, of the Soviet officers and Soviet soldiers. Um, 
again, uh, this is this is the, the photo from uh, Fidel Castro's visit to the Soviet Union when Khrushchev was trying to actually uh, restore relations, good relations between him and Castro, because Castro was absolutely, absolutely. Um, mm, uh, mm, uh, I don't know, offended by uh, the fact that he was not included into the negotiations between Khrushchev and, and Kennedy. So his revolution, he called it communist. It wasn't communist at that time. It was basically, in his mind, very much anti-colonial and anti-imperialist. And for him, it was an insult that uh, the leaders of the great powers uh, communicated without including him and were making decisions on what, what will happen with the nuclear weapons without asking him. So as a protest to that, he refused to allow either American or international, uh, um, American or international inspectors. And that was part of the deal between Kennedy and Khrushchev. So without, without the way to inspect whether the missiles were there or not, the deal would not work. And Khrushchev eventually was not able to convince Castro to do that and was ordered his commanders to actually show the missiles on their way back, something that eventually played, played an important role for him personally when it came to, the, uh, to, his, to his own job security. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> Now, um, this, is, this is a scene uh, of the, uh, of the uh, meeting of the executive XCOM, um, the um, forum where major key decisions were made by the, by the American, uh, by the American uh, participants, participants in that crisis. But what this picture, as, as well as the narrative that is presented in the 13 days obscures, is the fact that, as I mentioned to you, some of the most important decisions were not made in the high offices, either of Kennedy, of Khrushchev, or even Castro. But they were made on the ground. And uh, I'll give you uh, one, uh, a couple of examples of that. So the most frightening moments of the Cuban Missile Crisis came as the result of the actions that were never approved by the top three leaders. One of them was on the uh, so-called Black Saturday, the, the, key, the key moment in the history of the crisis, when the Soviet um, um, surface-to-ear missile uh, shoot down the uh, American um, U-2 airplane and kill the pilot. So that was the moment where the, the crisis turned really into, into a shooting war. Kennedy was under enormous pressure to respond. He was trying to play for time. He said, okay, it's already dark. Let's, let's revisit that in the morning. Now, because of darkness, we can't hit them anyway. But the decision was not, and the question was why Khrushchev decided to escalate. The question was that Khrushchev was as much surprised as Kennedy and was even more frightened by what happened than Kennedy was. Uh, the decision was made by the uh, two commanders, Soviet commanders on the ground in Cuba, who believed that actually the war had already started or was about to start because uh, Castro uh, ordered his own commanders to start shooting at the American airplanes. They couldn't hit the U-2, but the Soviets could hit. And with all this fire happening around and everyone expecting that the American invasion of the Cuba was coming, the Soviet commanders ordered the, 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 uh, one of their missiles to, to, to shoot at the, at the American uh, airplane and shoot it down. Uh, when, when Khrushchev learned about that, he started actually to, to back off, to de-escalate. De he started doing that even earlier, but that was, that was one of the key moments. Another, another episode that is discussed in my book is the uh, episode with the uh, Soviet nuclear armed submarines. There were four nuclear submarines that approached 
were in the um, approach the Caribbeans, were in Saragossa Sea, and um, the American Navy were actually uh, looking for them and uh, engaged in the in were trying to to hunt them down, and force them to 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 go to the to uh, to come to the surface. They were using the the practice charges, but the Soviet submariners there didn't know that those were practice charges. They thought that they were under attack. And there is an episode when they come to the surface and then an American airplane shows up with the, throwing this flare to get a better picture, a better photo of what was happening there. The commander of the submarine believes that now he is under attack. He rushes um, from the uh, from the um, this command post to the to, to the submarines and orders uh, prepare for uh, to for, uh, for firing the the nuclear nuclear armed torpedo. The other guy with the uh, they were communicating. The other guy with the searchlight because of the searchlight got stuck in the hatch. And the one, the commander that stayed still over there, he saw that the Americans are actually signaling apologists that you are not under attack. So the order was to use the nuclear torpedo was, was revoked. And there are cases like that where, where both, uh, another episode, the U-2 airplane uh, uh, gets off the course because of the uh, uh, of the um, uh, aurora lights and uh, gets into the Soviet airspace over Chukotka. The concern is that, uh, and in White House they understand that they're very concerned, but they, 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 they think that the Soviets would believe that this is the last reconnaissance flight before the nuclear attack on the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union could respond. So at least three cases where n n neither Kennedy nor Khrushchev nor Castro were really in charge, but actually situations were. The, the U.S. ascending its, its uh, the, the um, uh, fighter, fighter uh, um, jets to, to protect the U-2 airplane that, that is coming back. This, this, uh, they're, they're on the high alert. The only weapons that they have actually are also nuclear nuclear armed missiles, so that's the only thing that they have. Uh, and and uh, again cases like that again and again and again. So the the, the situation is really really getting out of control, and um, uh, the Question uh, again. Th th this is this is one of the Soviet uh, airplanes there. The reason why why the photo is there because the um, Cuban Missile Crisis wasn't a 13-day crisis. It was going for almost one month. Once the missile crisis that Robert Kennedy described ended, a new stage of the crisis started where the question was that uh, um, White House demanded from Khrushchev to remove the uh, bombers that were capable of delivering nuclear weapons. And Khrushchev refused. And it was only November 20th, 1962, that the crisis was finally resolved. So again, not 13 days. Um, that is the, the KGB photo from the KGB archives, uh, the, the, Soviet, uh, the Soviet ship in front, and then the, the, American, the American ship following it, uh, asking to show, to show the missiles on the way back, on the way back from Cuba. That's, that's a cartoon demonstrating that Khrushchev had difficult time uh, convincing Castro to give up nuclear weapons, in, in particular tactical nuclear weapons. Again, the U.S. didn't know about the tactical nuclear weapons, but but uh, Castro Castro certainly knew. Uh, that is Khrushchev and Marshal Malinovsky, the um, commander of the of the Soviet troops that eventually backed backed the coup against Khrushchev. Now, with all this list of near misses. 
misunderstandings, miscalculations, and so on and so forth. The question that probably you have is, okay, if I focused on that, why in the world we are still here? Why, why didn't, why, why didn't uh, the, the whole thing exploded into the, into the Third World War and nuclear war? One thing that I, I really realized only after researching that book and writing it, that there would be a Third World War if there would be no nuclear weapons. Because what, what stopped Kennedy and Khrushchev from escalation was the fear of the nuclear war. That one thing that despite of all misunderstandings, despite different educational background, culture, political, and otherwise, one thing that they shared, that was the fear of the nuclear war. Because otherwise, if there would be not that fear, that, that, that situation in the, in the Caribbean would end in the certainly American-Soviet fighting war and fighting conflict, and it actually was going there. Uh, uh, at least, at least the, the, the military were insisting on the, on the um, new landing in Cuba, thinking that there were 10,000 people, not 42,000, not knowing that there were not just strategic nuclear weapons, but also tactical nuclear weapons, and that the tactical nuclear weapons, the order was already prepared, not signed yet, giving the uh, authority to the commander on the ground to use those weapons. But as we know, the uh, commanders on the ground were shooting American airplanes even without order. So my, my conclusion is that it was that fear. It was that fear that saved the world, that fear that was shared by the two leaders that saved us. And uh, um, Khrushchev started, started to back off immediately already after the um, Kennedy's announcement of the um, of the uh, um, quarantine or this Navy blockade, ordering the um, ships that were bringing the missiles and nuclear weapons and still didn't deliver that stuff to Cuba, ordered, ordered them back. So the Soviets managed to deliver uh, the Soviets managed to deliver to Cuba uh, medium range missiles, but not. Uh, intermediate be because of that. Uh, Kennedy was so concerned that again he was insisting on this uh, swap of the missiles, the Cuban missiles for the uh, American missiles in Turkey. Uh, in the situation where Khrushchev was already prepared to take the deal where there would be just an American promise not to invade Cuba, not to attack Cuba. But they were almost outbidding each other in the final days of the crisis, or at least this first stage of the crisis, trying, trying to avoid this war. That is the end of the crisis, November 20th, when, when uh, uh, Kennedy gives a press conference and announces, announces the, end, the end of the crisis. Now, where does it leave us today? Well, um, We are in a situation very much that resembles the situation that the world was before the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. One thing that happened after the Cuban Missile Crisis because of that fear and scare was that Kennedy and Khrushchev next year in 1963 signed the first treaty that became the foundation for the arms control treaties of the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, leading, leading all the way into the Reagan and, and Gorbachev era. Uh, but all of those treaties, or most of them, 80% are gone by now. We are back in the situation that there was before Cuban Missile Crisis, with very little treaties to control the nuclear weapons, and the, we are back in the uncontrolled nuclear arms race with much more drivers on this nuclear highway than there was in 1960, 1961, or 1962, and no traffic lights. 
and a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, um, a, a lot of drivers. So uh, another thing where we are back and in the situation that is close to the Cuban Missile Crisis is the importance of the nuclear blackmail. Uh, I mentioned that Khrushchev was a master, master blackmail, and what we have today with Putin here certainly follows in the footsteps of Khrushchev. The situation to a degree is even more dangerous because one thing that uh, Putin is doing now is that he is attacking the country that gave up nuclear weapons, Ukraine declares annexation of parts of its territory, including the territory that he even doesn't control now and today, and then evokes a doctrine that Russia has the right to use nuclear weapons to dis defend itself. If that sort of blackmail works, really what we will see, we will see the actually the end of the international order as it exists today. Uh, Today in the world, there are only nine countries with nuclear weapons, but there are 40 or more than 40 countries that can have nuclear weapons within the next two years. The technology is not, is, is not something, something particularly cutting edge. Even North Korea can build atomic bomb and, and hydrogen bomb. And what we will see, we will see an explosion in the number of the states and countries that have nuclear weapons or are developing nuclear weapons. The non-proliferation regime, regime would be over. So um, what the world faces today is actually very similar to what the world uh, was facing back in 1962. The only way to actually uh, resolve this issue is to, to show the resolve and not blink first, as certainly that was done during the Cuban Missile Crisis. What we know from the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis is that people back then and there got incredibly lucky. One thing I can't promise you that we will get as lucky the next time around. Uh, mm, but there is, there is also a, a silver line in there. Like it was the case back in 1962, Russia or the Soviet Union is not the only nuclear power. There are other nuclear powers out there. And what we need as we move forward and we are entering the new stage in the nuclear race, we need uh, to, to recreate this balance not of terror but balance of fear. Balance of fear that saved us back in 1962. So we have to really re readjust, rethink the whole thing. We are back in the nuclear age and we have to educate ourselves and we have to educate our, our politicians. So mm, history provides us with lessons. It's up to us to learn them or not to learn, and I hope that we will learn them and we'll draw right, right lessons from things that, uh, uh, and, and stories, incredible stories like the one of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So it looks like I, I went a little bit longer than I was expected, sorry for that, and I will be more than happy to answer your questions. And I see I got, five bottles of water, so. <laughs> You're all taken care of. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful and insightful talk. We will now transition to the Q&A portion of the evening. So please come line up at either mics with your question. We'll be alternating between the two. As you come, make sure to introduce yourself, see your name, your class, as well as your major. Um, one question per person. Um, make sure to keep it brief. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my name is Aliyah, and I have a question about Mr. Putin. I'm a freshman at CMC. Um, one of the key similes that a lot of liberal Russian media use in relation to Putin, not, not actually similes, but one of the quotes that he uh, mentioned in one of his interviews is um, simile with the mouse that is being uh, um, dragged until the 
corner and has no way of of doing anything else and that like um, that mouse is so like fearful to some point and then it starts to just violently act at some like mm. a second afterwards and um, a lot of political uh, analysts say that this is something that he truly believes in and do you think that this is the showcase that he will not stop here when we, we talk about nuclear weapon? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, um, Дякую за запитання. Thank you very much for your question. Um, one thing that uh, you, you see here is that um, uh, Putin is certainly trying his best to paint himself into the corner. Uh, the annexation of the Ukrainian territory of the four regions, some of which he doesn't even control, and as uh, as the Russian territory puts him, puts him in the situation where allegedly he has to defend that. So this is, this is the position and the situation of his own choice. Uh, the question is how, how scared he is and how, how rational he is or not. Uh, mm, he, he raises the stakes, so it means he's not, he's not as scared. He, he doesn't feel himself to be that that rat in the, in, in the corner uh, that he, he talked about uh, describing his child, uh, childhood experience. Um, I agree with uh, President Biden's assessment that he is a rational player who, who miscalculated. And uh, when, you, uh, when he is um, met with, with resolve, he backs off. The latest, the latest example was uh, the uh, use as an excuse the attack, apparently Ukrainian attack on the, uh, on the uh, Black Sea Fleet, Russian Black Sea Fleet, as the pretext to end the, uh, to close the so-called grain corridor to stop allowing the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian ships, uh, ships bringing grain to Africa and Middle East and so on and so forth. He declared that he was not going to do that and then there was a conversation with President Erdogan. Apparently when, when Erdogan said, okay, we don't care, we will protect our ships, we are putting backs off. So he is there uh, taking huge political risks announcing mobilization, right? Uh, uh, so mm, this, is, this is an indication that this is a person who is quite rational, who is calculating his risks, and as long as the, uh, mm, his calculation that the risk of using nuclear weapons is, is not worth it, that the, the, the risk is high of using than not using, I think we are, we are uh, pretty safe. So I don't see that nu nuclear escalation coming mm, uh, anytime soon. So anytime soon means a couple of months, three months, then depending on what is, what, what is happening, what is happening on, on the front lines. But again, it's not, it's not an, immediate, an immediate danger and not immediate threat. Uh, that being said, the, the mm, war in Ukraine went nuclear in a certain way already on the first day with the Russian takeover of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, the Parisian nuclear power plant, the largest nuclear power plant in Europe. That is the first case of the use of the, the, the um, uh, army, the, 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 the battle, um, the nuclear power site is turned into a battleground where is shelling is taking place where one of the buildings caught fire, where there is a possibility of new, new, not just nuclear blackmail but also nuclear accident. That, 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 that possibility, from my point of view, in terms of the nuclear threat, is much, much bigger than the, the use of the nuclear weapons. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chad. I'm a, a freshman here at CMC. Um, you mentioned earlier, when you were uh, talking in regards to Russia, their policy surrounding the use of nuclear weapons should they feel an existential threat. One thing that has come along with this is the prevalence of Russia's tactical nuclear weapons and a, as it compares to the United States, is somewhat seen as an advantage uh, compared to our overwhelming amounts of strategic nuclear weapons. Um, over the past decades or so, there's been a movement within the US to 
modernize our nuclear weapons and also to expand our capabilities when it comes to tactical, tactical nuclear weapons, such as um, our gravity bombs, our cruise missiles. Um, in 2017, there was a push by the Trump administration to have a small, um, they did get it pushed through, a smaller submarine launched uh, nuclear warhead that was only five kilotons as opposed to the 400 something before. Um, but within this movement, there's a push to make nuclear weapons more usable, more accessible, more tailored to be just more, like able to be used in different circumstances. And I wanna ask, is this a move that is good to be using in response to say Russia's growing or their advantage in tactical nuclear weapons, or is it simply something that's increasing the risk for nuclear weapons being used by any side? Yeah. Well, um, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, the nature of the arms race of any kind in nuclear as well is that if uh, one side got this type of a gadget, you, you are getting the same type of a gadget, and, and the, the, the idea is that not to allow advantage on the other side and invitation to use to use it um, <clears throat> um, so uh, in, in that sense again that's that's one of the uh, that's one of the uh, uh, m things that we learned in general during the 20th century but also during the the, the nuclear age in particular so uh, I would say that again uh, I, I want to see the world without spending and, and spending again on, 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 the, on the nuclear race or any arms race. Uh, but that, uh, that, that one, one thing that keeps, keeps the balance of fear being a balance. Uh, generally, there is, there is a change in terms of thinking about the nuclear weapons. Again, since the nuclear weapons are there, there is different, different approaches during uh, when Eisenhower comes to power in the early 50s, he looks at the nuclear weapons as any other weapon at, at, at your disposal. So the idea was, okay, why we are losing war in Korea when we have this uh, superior, uh, superior arms and we are, not, we are not using it. But then hydrogen age come along in the mid-1950s, and that's, that's where Eisenhower also thinks that any uh, m m once you start the nuclear war with uh, uh, tactical nuclear weapons, there is no way of keeping it actually on that level. That's, that's, that's the, the, the nuclear war that, that will be there. 1960s the, 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 and 70s, the idea of the mutually assured destruction. Again, the, the balance of fear that is there and keeps keeps world relatively safe. When the, the new escalation happens, it's in the 1980s. When President Reagan comes with basically a very noble idea, that the balance of terror is bad, let's actually create something that we can protect ourselves, not offensive, but defensive. But what that means, if you have weapons that can defend you, that makes actually you less vulnerable and your, your enemy more vulnerable. So again, again, this balance. Uh, so now there is, there is thinking about tactical weapons. The good thing about tactical weapons is that they were never used and never tried. And uh, I hope it, it, it will stay that way. But again, we are just in one of the many cycles of rethinking of what the nuclear weapons are, how to deliver them. The, the, the nuclear weapons themselves, they don't get much, much improved, but the systems of the delivery are there. So again, unfortunately, welcome, welcome back to the to the Cold War and, and the nuclear arms race with all, with all uh, limited pluses and and unlimited minuses. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Kirill. I'm a senior at Pomona. Um, I have a little bit of a question for you about the current ongoing conflict that we see today between with Russian aggression in Ukraine and kind of an analogy to what was going on in the Cuban Missile Crisis and your thoughts on it. So to the best of my understanding, you know, you had the Cuban Missile Crisis with the threat that the United States saw in the Soviet Union placing nuclear weapons very near to its borders with, you know, the capability of a, of a tactical strike on the continental U.S. and 
that drove the United States to take very, very drastic measures. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on the argument that the expansion of Western influence, um, you know, and NATO and other things happening in Eastern Europe had on the influence of decision making that Putin has made in his aggression in Ukraine and what your thoughts are on Western leaders' decision making when it came to that and whether or not they could have learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis and how the United States reacted um, or whether or not this is, you know, something totally different. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the, the closest parallels with the Cuban Missile Crisis that I see is in this nuclear blackmail that, that, that I talked about. Uh, the parallels uh, in the, in the um, mm, events leading to the, to the current war and the Cuban Missile Crisis are more difficult to, to draw. Um, my, my usual answer to that is please show me American missiles and American uh, troops on the ground in Ukraine and then we can compare Cuban Missile Crisis and the current war. Um, that answers maybe part of your question, but not, not, not entirely. The, the broader question was the, the NATO expansion, what, what impact um, it, it might have had on, on Putin, especially given that before the war, um, uh, Putin really was talking about, about NATO expansion as a threat. Um, the negotiations that led nowhere showed that he, he didn't treat that seriously because he put the ultimatum that no, everyone knew that it, it, wouldn't, it was not the basis for any sort of negotiation. He didn't react much when uh, f uh, Finland and, 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 and Sweden decided to join NATO. Um, so uh, these this things indicate that there, is the, there are different reasons for, 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 the, for the war that is being fought. The war started in 2014. It didn't start in 2022. The trigger to the war was the um, Ukrainian desire to sign association agreement with European Union. So it's not NATO, it's not even membership in European Union, association agreement. Why it became so important? If uh, the country that signs association agreement with European Union can't really be a member of any other economic entity than that union, and uh, Putin's plan back in 20, 2013, 2014 was actually reintegration, not in the form of the Soviet Union, but in some form. Reintegration under the, Russia's control, the post-Soviet space. Uh, and emerging as one of the poles in multipolar world where the European Union would be one, China another, and Russia on the post-Soviet space, the third one. So his, his really ambitions is, is the rest, um, revisionist and restorationist. The, the um, Soviet Union in his, uh, the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union in his mind is the biggest geostrategic tragedy of the 20th century, not World War II, but, but the fall of the Soviet Union. So uh, his, uh, his, his real, his real uh, ambitions were the post-Soviet space, and the post-Soviet space can't be, can't be reintegrated without Ukraine. The reason is Ukraine turned out to be the second largest post-Soviet republic in terms of the population, in terms of the, of the economic, economic potential. So the Soviet Union fell on the issue of Ukraine. Um, Ukrainian referendum on independence, December 1st, 1991. One week later, the Soviet Union is being dissolved. No other republic in the Soviet Union had referendum. Ukrainians didn't vote for the dissolution of the Soviet Union. They voted for independence of their country. But without the second largest republic, uh, Yeltsin in Russia was not interested in continuation with a very expensive, economically damaging project of the supporting of all post-Soviet space and post-Soviet republics. So it is about, it, it is a continuation, this war continuation of the uh, fall of the Soviet Union. And that's, that's what is at the center, what is at the core. Whether, whether Putin would prefer NATO to be further away, absolutely. But that's not even a trigger in, in, the, in this current war. 
Good evening, Professor. My name is Esther. And first, I want to thank you so much for your insightful talk today and the excellent conversation with you at the table. So my question will be, like, from your perspective, how would you evaluate the role of president in terms of facing like those kind of national securities, uh, like the crisis of Cuban Missile Crisis? And also, how do you like evaluate the decisions taken by GFK at that time? And how would you like uh, you kind of like comment the certain days as a technique used by GFK for his presidential election. But from a more general view, would you think that this kind of movie also contribute to uh, helping gaining those kind of national supports toward the president and those cultivated the patriotism of the United, Sta United States citizens? So uh, yeah, basically this would be my yeah. question. OK, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I will answer uh, answer um, really your question in entirety, but I, I'll comment on it. Um, one thing that uh, is is very clear to me that it's it's very dangerous to have a president who is considered by the other side to be weak and uh, someone who basically, in that sense, invites invites uh, some form of aggression. Because that was the case, how how Kennedy was perceived, young, inexperienced, indecisive. That was uh, not only opinion of Khrushchev. Uh, Eisenhower attacked him. Khrushchev preferred Kennedy to Nixon, whom he considered to be much more experienced and tougher, and so on and so forth. So the situation where the president is perceived to be to be weak and easy to push around is one of the contributing factors to the uh, Berlin Wall crisis and then Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, how, Kennedy, how Kennedy handled this, this, this whole situation? Again, he was, uh, he was uh, on a certain level prepared to, uh, at the beginning to make this strike against, against the missiles and so on and so forth that may be m more experienced and more secure in terms of if his standing in the country, president would not do, but he had, he had to a degree overreact. But at the end of the day, uh, Kennedy got, in, in my opinion, really very high marks because at the end, once he realized that the missiles were there and they had nukes, he was, he, and he was actually, his, he, his decisions were very, a very, uh, I, I would say, position balanced. He was keeping keeping the military at a distance. They were really pushing for the for the invasion. He was trying to do whatever in his in his power, making secret deals, backdoor deals regarding Turkish missiles. And one thing that changed as the result of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The roles between Kennedy and Khrushchev changed. If before Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy is a more experienced uh, bully who is trying to bully a younger, a younger less experienced colleague. The, uh, Kennedy emerges out of that crisis as a winner. At home, uh, he, 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 gets, uh, he, he gets credits for that and gets uh, midterm elections going, going his way. It seems to me the Democratic Party and this Democratic president doesn't lose seats but gains a little bit. Uh, which was quite quite extraordinary, especially at that time, and also in relations with Khrushchev. Khrushchev is on the defensive, and the the treaty on the banning of the nuclear tests in, in atmosphere uh, was signed basically very much in the American conditions, not on the Soviet ones. So Cuban Missile Crisis dramatically changes changes standing of of Kennedy uh, in on the international arena and in the country. Kennedy that. We now know this is the Kennedy of post-Cuban Missile Crisis. This is not the Kennedy before that. Um, Thank you so much. A quick interjection. This will be the last question of the night. Hello. Uh, my name is Sophia. I'm a freshman from Scripps. Thank you very much. Uh, this is super informative. Um, I actually have two questions, but um, how about just the one, whichever one is uh, better to answer. Um, my first question was, you know, this, this security dilemma idea. It's often heard that, like, with the security dilemma, there's really no way out 
but war. And so like it's kind of inevitable that with each country building up weapons to try and keep up with the perceived threat of the other country, that they're really, it's so much harder to de-escalate than it is to just kind of slip up and make one mistake and then it's too late. So with, uh, with the US and Russia kind of ramping up the security dilemma again, how likely is it that we would go the same way that the Cuban Missile Crisis did and kind of step back if it's so much harder? And then the second question <laughs> is, I just wish everyone is, is better to answer. How much have we learned and have we learned actually enough? Or are we still gonna make the same mistakes we did the first time? Like, have we really learned? Like the, the way the political stage is set now for um, our response and their response, have we learned everything that we need to? Mm -hmm. So, would you yeah, have a question? Sure, thank you, thank you. Uh, well, um, is the security dilemma. Uh, the, the, the most dangerous moments are when uh, there is a revisionist power, revisionist force, and it tries actually to change, to change the balance or, or, or bring into balance something. And uh, Khrushchev was certainly, certainly in, in that position. Um, they, for the first time, were making claims for the territories outside of the immediate neighborhood of the Soviet Union, getting into the Latin America, Caribbean, and, uh, and uh, uh, trying to, to rival the United States again in the, globally, and also with, with the nuclear weapons. So um, Khrushchev was, was a revisionist power who was trying to re, rebalance the, the entire system. And uh, um, uh, Putin is now, Putin is now in the same in the same position. So, uh, to a degree that um, there, 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 there is no there, there is no again that brings me back to the balance of fear. There is no balance of fear. Uh, it's it's very unstable system, and we are we are going through now period of that of that instability. And in terms of lessons learned. And it seems to me that was part of also of the previous lesson. Um, I, I don't see any, any particular, a lot of references to the Cuban Missile Crisis. I don't see there is much, much of learning happening there. Generally, the last uh, five years made me very pessimistic about our ability as, as societies to learn because we are very much see the repeat of the 1930s with the with the Great Depression, Great Recession, rise of xenophobia, rise of the populism, rise of the authoritarian tendencies, uh, and, and, and all of that leading to the war. Uh, I personally believed that we somehow learned from the experience of the 1930s and 1940s, and uh, um, the way how I look now at the world is very pessimistic from the point of view of, of the, of the uh, history and, and ability of history to, to deliver those lessons. Um, so um, again, we, we have to wake up to the, to the realization that we are very much in, in as dangerous place as the world was in the 1930s because many of the factors are the same, the, the history rhymes in, in, in the same way. Uh, so again, it's, it's, it's uh, not completely pessimistic, but it's, it's, uh, it's not optimistic either, the, the way how I look at uh, the ability of us to, to learn. Uh, but the, 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 there are some lessons, for example, uh, of not related to the Cuban Missile Crisis that certainly the, the United States learned. From the start of World War, too, because the, the uh, World War II uh, mm, is not really started by, by mm, Hitler on, on, on September 1st, 1939. Hitler started original war against Poland. But the mm, um, guarantees that were given to Poland uh, by Britain and France were actually automatically uh, m m making those countries to, to start the war. So they tried to get around that. They, they declared the war. There is a phony war where they are not fighting. But eventually the war is there and, and Hitler, Hit Hitler attacks, uh, attacks France. So from that point of view, the United States didn't give Ukraine guarantees in exchange for the nuclear weapons, but assurances which suggested that 
The United States could intervene it if it wanted. With this war, uh, Biden went out of his way saying that whatever happens, U.S. will not be part of that war. There will be no boots on the ground and so on and so forth, which m many criticized him saying, okay, removing the military uh, option from the table serves really as an invitation for aggression. Uh, so that was not an argument that actually you have to, you have to intervene, but actually um, without keeping the strategic ambiguity or whatever, a tactical ambiguity that this is, you, you, you're given carte blanche for aggression. But that was partially also the lesson of, uh, not just of Afghanistan or Iraq, that was the lesson also of the, of the World War II. So some learning, at least on the diplomatic level, is happening, whether we're learning as, as, as societies. That's, that's probably a more complicated question to answer. Okay. Please join me in thanking Professor Pokey for the amazing talk today. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much once again for your question. And thank you as well to the Gold Center for hosting such amazing programming like the Learner Lecture Series. And thank you all for coming and joining us today on this cold and rainy night. Have a wonderful day.